Hi, Tony DeWitt here, Missouri Appellate Attorney and a guy who likes to make the law make sense on YouTube. Today we are going to take a moment out and answer a couple of questions. The first one being whether or not the um, failure of the SLED agent to be um, accurate with the grand jury is in any way going to be an appellate issue and what the strength of that appellate issue is. And then second, somebody asked me to take a look at the cross-examination of Mark Tinsley, and I'm going to do that. And then third, I'm going to give you a brief tour around my office and explain to you why the beach background is so much better than anything else I could show you in here. So with all of that said, uh, what do you say we um, head on down to the beach and talk about that? I'll see you down there. Now, I'm not going to wear that floppy hat and sunglasses when I do my videos, but I wanted to uh, make a point, sort of a public service announcement here. Uh, at age 67, you learn a few things, and one of the things that I have learned is how very important sunglasses are. If you're in your 20s, 30s, or 40s, and you don't routinely wear sunglasses when you're outside at this point, and you spend a fair amount of time outside, go buy some sunglasses. And... If you, in fact, what I would recommend is you buy about nine pairs of sunglasses and you stick them everywhere. Every car that you own, every, uh, every place where you might have an opportunity to go outside, your office, uh, your home, your vacation home, whatever it is, get yourself some sunglasses and wear them outside religiously when it's sunny. Obviously, I'd be kind of silly to wear them in a rainstorm, but Get yourself some sunglasses because the sun really does have an effect. It, it can cause cataracts and uh, having had both of mine removed, I can honestly say that uh, the, the need for sunglasses is real. I might not have required eye surgery if I had taken better care of my eyes earlier in my life. And then the hat, the big floppy hat. Well, in addition to causing problems within your eye, the sun can and frequently does cause melanoma. And one of the places that it hits quite frequently is your ears. So if you wear a ball cap and you really like the ball cap because it's comfortable and you can put it on and put it off the right way, it's time to get rid of, the, of that and get yourself a floppy hat if you're going to spend more than about five minutes outside. Because the floppy hat will provide shade for your ears and your ears will uh, indeed thank you for that later on. Unless, of course, you're a Vincent Van Gogh fan and want to look that way. But my, my suggestion is take good care of your body while you can because when you get to be 67 and old and stiff and crotchety and yelling at your kids on the lawn, you know, to get off of your lawn, um, you'll probably have a, a better result if you have taken better care of yourself earlier on. With that PSA out of the way, let's look at the grand jury testimony. I did a little research over the weekend, and I looked specifically at the issue of how you challenge an indictment in South Carolina. And generally speaking, unless the indictment is incorrect on its face, in other words, unless there is an error that, for example, it doesn't charge all of the elements of the crime or something like that, uh, you can't really challenge an indictment. Once the grand jury has returned a true bill and it becomes an indictment, well then, in that situation, you absolutely are stuck with the indictment. The state of South Carolina has a statute directly on point. It talks about when the allegations are sufficient for an indictment, and also what the allegations sufficient for an indictment of murder are. So these are the things that control what must be in the indictment in order for that indictment to be good. The statutes go on to tell you that every objection to any indictment for any defect apparent on the face thereof shall be taken by demur, which is basically a motion to dismiss, or motion to quash such indictment before the, grand, before the jury shall be sworn and not afterwards. So, in other words, you absolutely have to challenge an indictment before you get to trial, and once the jury is sworn, you can no longer challenge the indictment. And of course, if the proof differs from what's in the indictment, well, then the statute allows you to amend it as well. 
the issue is in that case is that there is some assertion that uh, some evidence was presented to the grand jury which wasn't exactly correct, specifically the blood splatter evidence. Um, and of course, part of that is because Alex Murdoch's clothes that he was wearing at or near the time of the murders have never been found. Um, but the, the long and short of it is the t-shirt he was wearing didn't have any blood spatter on it. And that's a problem for the plane, I mean, for the state. It truly is. Especially because they said that it did have it, and then later on they had to come back and say, well, we were wrong about that. And of course, the assertion from the defense was, well, you lied to the grand jury. Well, lying is an intentional act, and it's a, a especially, uh, it's something to that's done to manipulate things or, or to cause harm. It is an intentional, wrongful act, lying is. But when you are mistaken about something, you just don't have your facts straight, that's a little bit different. And I believe that in a, a reviewing appellate court would look at that and say, well, you know, you had the opportunity to cross-examine him on it. And they did. They And they cross-examined him very brutally on the issue of, you know, the fact that he said there was blood spatter when there wasn't, and that, th that he used that to get the grand jury indicted. And of course, that fit into their entire theme of the police blew this, the, the deputies and everybody were out to get him from the beginning, and it's all been a witch hunt, and you know all the stuff that, that has been said. I, I think when an appellate court looks at it, even if they found that that was problematic, and of course that has to be asserted as a separate point on appeal, and they have to assert in the point on appeal that it caused prejudice, that the outcome would be different, but for the uh, assertion of the incorrect evidence, that that would have changed the grand jury's view. Well, I don't think it would have given all of the other evidence that was presented to the grand jury. He was the last person to see Maggie and Paul alive. He they could not account for his time uh, in the way that he should have been able to account for his time. And there were all kinds of other issues. He had a huge issue with this boat case. And I think that it was sort of the perfect storm. And the grand jury did what they had to do. I don't think an appellate court would be able to find that that was the key critical piece of information that pushed the grand jury over the edge and caused them to give an indictment. I just don't think that. I think that far more likely they would consider that to be harmless error, if it was error at all. And then the fact is, the cross-examination brought all of this out. Anything that was negative about that was heard by the jury. And I might add, it was discounted significantly. The fact that he did not have blood splatter on his t-shirt was less important to the jury, I think, than the fact that the clothes he had been wearing only minutes before he left to go to uh, his mom's house were missing and were never found. That's shirt, pants, and shoes. Never found. And the fact that he smelled like clean laundry at the time that he was interviewed that also sort of stands to makes you stand to reason that maybe he was uh, at, at that particular hour of the night and given what a stressful situation he had supposedly just discovered, it probably did not track well uh, with his uh, claim of innocence, let's put it that way. Then on the other side of the coin, you have to look at it from the standpoint of a denial of due process. Part of the denial of due process is if you knowingly stack the deck against the defendant in a grand jury, that is a deprivation of a liberty interest, and it could very easily be cited in an appeal, and there might be some traction to it. But again, the problem boils down to would the grand jury have made a different decision? And when you look at all of the other evidence that was presented to the grand jury, I doubt very seriously if they would have made a different decision. That's where I think the grand jury issue comes in. Now, there are a lot of people out there who believe that Alex was uh, unfairly convicted. I understand that. I think you are absolutely entitled to that opinion, and in time you may be proved right. I don't know. None of us has a crystal ball. And as somebody else pointed out, it is the 
uh, advocacy of the lawyers involved, the people who do the appeal, that are really going to determine whether or not an appeal goes anywhere. But I don't think this is the, to, the hill to die on. I really don't. I think there are much better avenues for appeal than the grand jury issue. Because once the grand jury hears what they hear and issue their true bill, unless there is a screw-up on the face of the indictment, it can't be challenged. And there are numerous cases in this regard in South Carolina. There is a recent Supreme Court decision from the South Carolina Supreme Court that deals with this issue where a factual issue came up in the uh, challenge to a, an indictment. And they said that the facts didn't support the indictment. Well, as a result, the judge threw out the indictment and the South Carolina Supreme Court reinstated it saying an indictment is an indictment. If you want to challenge the facts, you have to do that at trial. The next issue, somebody asked me to take a look at the cross-examination of Mark Tinsley. Now, I saw little snippets of Tinsley's testimony, uh, particularly the part where he talked about being uh, confronted by Alex Murdaugh and all of that. But I had not paid a lot of attention to the cross-examination. And... I really wish that I had spent more time with it. It it looked like it was a rather, when I did look at probably two to three minutes of it early on, it looked to me like it was kind of a pedantic exercise, like perhaps Dick or Jim was trying to school a young associate in the art of cross-examination. And if that is what they teach for cross-examination, then um, I pity that poor guy because he did not learn very much. Uh, and his cross-examination was tremendously ineffective. You have two goals on cross-examination. Hurt the other guy's case and help yours. If you hurt the other guy's case, but you hurt your case more, that is not cross-examination, that is suicide. And so the, the gist of this is that you have to be surgical. You have to get what you can get. Now, ideally, you've done a deposition, but if you haven't done a deposition, you have scanned the documents in all of the cases, particularly in Tinsley's case. You should never be surprised by anything that has happened prior to your cross-examination because you never ask a question that you don't know the answer to. And on cross-examination, there was a segment where uh, Tinsley is being cross-examined and he said, the, the cross-examiner said something to the effect of, well, you know, that's not what the order said. And he said, no, I think that's exactly what the order said. You want to see the order? And the lawyer did a really dumb thing and said, yeah. And he reached into his pocket and pulled out the order. And then he got to talk not only about what the order said, but what the order meant. Now, here I have to deviate just a little bit and talk about... Uh, why there was a little bit of an effort here to distract the jury from the real deal in that cross-examination. In both state and federal courts in the last 10 to 15 years, judges have gotten really tired of dealing with ninja lawyers whose goal it always seems to the judges is to slice and dice the other lawyer as opposed to win the case. Now, litigation can very often become personal and you can come to the end of a case just really disliking the guy on the other side but you can't let that affect your choice of actions during the case but unfortunately all lawyers do that so what judges have started to do and in many ways it's a good thing is they have started to push lawyers out and say look don't bring this issue to me until you have sat down and met and conferred about this and tried to negotiate a peaceful resolution to it because one of the two of you is not going to like my order if I have to rule on this. As a result of that, both plaintiffs and defendants in civil cases and the state and the defendant in criminal cases tend to get somewhat rational about settling their own disputes so the judge does not have to. Now, in that cross-examination, one of the issues was what the order said. According to Tinsley, what the orders required was that they would give 
Tinsley the information, and if the information they gave Tinsley wasn't uh, sufficient, that he could come back and ask for more at a later hearing. But it was apparent from the context of the order that Tinsley had won that motion. Now keep in mind, that occurred three days after Murdaugh killed his wife and son. And as a result of that, that the prosecution tried to use that win, which occurred three days later, as being part of the gathering storm. But if the defense had been on the ball, here's what I think should have happened. They should have objected and said, look, anything that happened after June 7th could not have played any role in Alex's actions. And if they want to talk about the motion to compel, they can talk about it, but they can't talk about the outcome of that motion to compel because on June 7th, Alex didn't know what the outcome was going to be. As a result, they allowed that ever, you know, nobody objected to that at the time they were discussing this, and it actually comes in and it winds up hurting them. Now, at one point, the cross-examiner said, well, if you had gotten to the point where this was going to be decided by the judge, what would you have gotten? The proper objection at that point is calls for speculation, because Tinsley has no idea what he would have gotten. I mean, he might have gotten a win, he might have gotten a loss, you just don't know. But the bottom line is the proper objection is calls for speculation, and they didn't make that objection. Now, later on, Tinsley, I think trying to help out the prosecution, says, well, you're just asking me to speculate. And at that point, somebody on the prosecution side should have jumped up and said, Your Honor, um, we object, calls for speculation. That's what they should have done, but they didn't do that. The lack of objections on both sides of this case were really pretty startling to me. But again, in a cross-examination, you ask tight-controlled questions that you already know the answer to, one fact at a time, and you build the wall with that set of facts. What you don't do is go, tell me about what happened at the motion hearing, because that is not a cross-examination question. That is an open-ended question that somebody asks in a direct examination. So I have a lot of criticisms there. Let me tell you who I don't have a criticism of, though. And this will probably sh shock many of you, but I saw a video yesterday from Dick Harputlian talking in the South Carolina Senate. And for those of you who don't know, I didn't know this at the beginning of the case, Dick is a Democrat senator from Richland, South Carolina. Dick talked about the emails that he got. Apparently, people went to his firm website, got his email, and sent him all kinds of hate mail. And he made the point that, you know, our system works when both sides are represented. Every criminal defendant has a right to be represented by counsel. Now, you don't have to exercise that right. Daryl Brooks proved that. But you absolutely have that right. And perhaps more importantly, that's the lawyer's job, and it's his obligation and his duty under the law to represent his client zealously to the limits of the law. And I think that Dick believed that that was what he was doing. And he said that people who did not understand that needed to go out and read a book. You can find, I believe it's on uh, Channel 19 out of North Carolina, the Fox station there. They have some video of him speaking in the Senate. And it's worthwhile to listen to because while I did not agree with many of the things that he did or said during the trial, I do think that he discharged the highest duty of a lawyer, the highest calling of a criminal defense lawyer, is to represent people that are disrespected and that the public finds disgusting. Every person who has been accused of a notorious crime, from Casey Anthony to the Parkland shooter, was entitled to have a criminal defense attorney at their side advocating for them. If you have never had the pleasure of having to deal with a case in a criminal court filed by either the state or the federal government, it is a little like being thrown into a cage with a 1,200 pound grizzly bear who says, I'm going to eat you up and I'm going to do it slowly so that you get to enjoy, enjoy the whole process. And that's pretty much what criminal law is like for a defendant. Now, the 
A lot of people earn that, right, by what they do. They earn that. But people who really are truly innocent do not earn that. And as a result, it is the highest calling of the lawyer to do exactly that, to represent people who, for whatever reason, are not considered among the best and brightest in our society. One more thing, I want to talk a little bit about the beach background. The beach background is there for a couple of reasons, but probably the most important is because the office here is very small. It's about 12 by 12, and I have a computer that I do my regular work at, my legal work, and indeed my film editing. I have a computer that I do my ham radio work with. I have another Mac over here that I use for other purposes. And then I have a television set and a work table over here, as well as some workspace over here, printers all over the place. And unfortunately, I am not the neatest person in the world. Oh, I also have two file cabinets that are covered with ham radios and chargers. So as you might imagine, this is not the neatest and most pristine environment upon which to film videos talking about the law. I think the beach background is a lot better, but I did promise one of my viewers here that I would show my ham radios, so I'm going to do that as well as the other background, and I do hope you all can forgive me because the beach background is so much better than my office, and, you know, in a perfect world, you would have time to straighten everything up and do everything right and keep your office neat and tidy. Unfortunately, I'm not that guy. Um, I actually work better in chaos, I think, and as a result of that, sometimes my office looks like chaos. That's what I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate all of your comments and your subscriptions and your efforts to try and make this channel better. You guys are great people, every last one of you. Even the people who disagree with me are great people, and I appreciate you being here. Thanks again for watching. If you have the opportunity, do something kind for someone today. And I will catch you on here next time. If you like this video, here are a few others you might try. And don't forget to subscribe. Have a terrific day, guys.